Hey, hey, everybody. Oh, man, super duper excited to have the one, the only Mr. UK Chow, founder, author. He's an international key speaker. Gamification is his game. It is his focus. It's what he has seemed to master more than anybody else I've seen in the space, which is impressive because there's a lot of people in it. He gets into behavioral design and he has a book coming out that focuses more on what I focus on, which is the personal development aspect of it, but he also helps businesses to level up by using these types of principles. And I couldn't be more excited. He's the author of UK Chow, Mr. Actionable Gamification, which gets into the octalysis and our core drives. There's eight of them and how we use them to motivate, kind of trick our little lizard brains into doing these things that we should and want to do versus being manipulated by other big tech for their own personal gain to monetize our attention. So Mr. UK Chow, thank you very much for being on the show. It's a pleasure being here. So let's get right into it. Why don't you just give us a little background on a couple minutes on sort of your background and how you got here and what, what brought you into the field of gamification. And then I really wanna just dive deep into how to use it to help people. Sure, so I'm UK Chow and I started my gamification career, you could say in 2003, 20 years ago. And at the time, I was a very heavy gamer. I invested thousands of hours into making my in-game character strong, getting gold, getting gear. And at one point, I quit at the time Diablo 2, and I felt extremely empty. So I thought, wow, what if I put those thousand hours into my real life to improve my skills? I would actually be high level in the real world, not just in a game. So it led me down this research path, and this obsession about how do you make games where the more hours you spend on it, the better your real life is. And how to make just normal things in the real world more enjoyable. So I created a few different startups. Some were more successful than others. Then in 2012, this is nine years later, I stepped down as a CEO of a startup called Reward Me, which is a gamified loyalty program for restaurants. And I just started writing about my experience in my blog, ukaichao.com. And I published what now is known as the Octalysis Framework. And it just really picked up. It was translated organically into, I think, 16 different languages on year one. And I started getting a lot of invitations to teach this framework and consult at places like Stanford, Harvard, Yale, Oxford, Tesla, IDEA, Uber, Google, Lego, all these different places. And eventually published that book you are holding 100, that we sold 100,000 copies for called Actionable Gamification Beyond Points and Badges and Leaderboard. And we never really did a book tour promotion because I'm not a full-time author. I'm running three companies. So once I finished the book, I went, kind of went back to work. So kind of each year actually sells better than the year before. So it's, it's good that it builds momentum on its own. If you go to Google Scholar and you search for the word octalysis, you'll see about 2,200 PhD thesis, academic journals, referencing the octalysis framework in my book. So it's just very blessed to have it also be recognized in the academic world. And about a couple of European organizations have rated me the number one gamification guru in the world, three out of four years. And I was also contracting a chief experience officer for one of the co-founders of Ethereum in the blockchain space. I was head of creative labs for, and head of digital commerce for HTC doing VR, AR metaverse stuff. Yeah, and just some other random things. It was knighted by a Korean prince or emperor and other random stuff. But yeah, that's pretty much me and just trying to make my life fun and help others do the same thing. I love it, man. That's an even more impressive resume than I was aware of. And that's my focus. That's exactly why I wanted to interview and I'm super excited to have you. We make change fun is, is, is what we say. And I can't wait to dive into this. Why fun is important and how it's been underutilized in the past and things like willpower and hope being our main drivers of trying to get things done and why it's failed so miserably and how we can use fun into actually moving the needle and building that momentum in our life. So the first question I'd want to ask you is just overall, what are you most passionate about as, a, as an individual? Is it the gamification? Is it how you're applying that to the business world, to the personal development world? Yeah. Tell us a little bit about so that. I think my game is really about creating the most amount of impact. So I've stumbled upon something I see very useful, very good. It's changed my life. I've seen change many people's lives. And I just wanted to create as big of an impact as possible. So I think last time we calculated, my designs have 
affected over a billion, 1.5 billion users. And that's really nice kind of impact. Now, some of it is just like touch point. There's, there's depth and there's width, right? Width is like, I reduced a click for a billion people. Depth would be like, I saved the life of one or two people, right? And I definitely have saved life because we've worked on things to gamify safety in a factory setting and also driving. So don't really know how to quantify that, but for sure the numbers have decreased in terms of injury rates, et cetera. But that's my game. My game is to create the most amount of impact possible. And then I will, after some negative experience I've had about 11 years ago, I also made sure that I'm going to have fun with what I do. So if I, I'm doing the same thing for two years and not enjoying it, I should completely change directions. So, so that's basically yeah, my game objective is these days. Thank you. I love that. And yeah, this octolysis that has touched over a billion people and just your system, how did you come up with it? Because yeah, I mean, let me just pause real quick on what you said, how that's your goal. Every person I feel like that I've interviewed or every book I've read, podcasts, when people have quote unquote success, I was putting quotes because it means different things to different people. But for me, success is not only having your career be in line with your strengths and your passions, but making an impact and being able to leave a legacy in the world. It's one of those things that when you're younger and you're hungry and you're trying to just make your way in the world, it's not really on the radar, but I try to really just emphasize people like you that come on the show that like that really is what it's about. And you want to be careful not to go down a road of just trying to make money to make money because you don't, and you're not enjoying what you're doing and passionate about it. And it's going to help mankind. Cause as you get older, Sounds like you figured this one out. It took me a while too, because I built a business from scratch, built it up. We sold for nine figures and I knew what was coming because I'd been reading a lot of personal development stuff since I was a teen, but it really hit home when we got that paycheck and I technically didn't have to work for the rest of my life. And it was like, wow, this feels amazing. And then it was like five days later, okay, now what? <laughs> right? Like, And how am I going to actually do good things and, and try to help this planet? Now, and I, I don't know. Do you have children? Oh, yeah, twin daughters, Symphony and Harmony. There you go. And that always elevates it too. When you have kids, it's like, okay, well, I need to make this planet as awesome as possible for these little creatures that I brought in, right? So kudos to you and what you're doing. And uh, I'm jealous. That's my goal to affect over a billion people. You're uh, there. I don't have that nine uh, figure exit. So full respect <laughs> well, to you too. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you will if you wanted it. So let's get into the octolysis. So where did this come from? How did you come up with Octolysis? Yeah, so there's a personal story that's about discovering my strengths and attributes, and that could be a follow-up question, but in more precise terms, how I created it was more, I studied a lot of games, and I was very curious about why some games, people are addicted for like crazy for a few months, and they absolutely don't want to play the game anymore. A lot of games like Farmville, people are crazy for six, eight months, and then they just, they burn out. And why some games people can play forever, like chess for centuries. And so I started studying these games. I started looking at games that are very similar to each other. So some are just clones, but somehow one is very successful, one's a failure. So I want to understand why that is. And so I realized that number one, it's not because one has game elements and the other doesn't, right? They both have points, badges, leaderboards, right. leveling up, Easter eggs, they're copycats. But again, one is successful, one is not. And then it's also not because of the graphics. Sometimes the visually stunning game is a huge failure and the relatively ugly low pixel games like Minecraft becomes a huge hit. So at the end of the day, I realized that there's these eight core drives that motivate all our behaviors in a game and also in real life. And then I was able to derive that some of these motivational core drives are what we call white hat motivation core drives. So it makes people feel powerful in control, they feel good. And then there's also the what we call black hat motivation core drives that makes people feel obsessed, urgent, sometimes addicted. And then there's also what we saw as what, what I call left brain core drive. Doesn't mean it's geographical left versus right, but it symbolically represents logical brain versus right brain core drive, emotional brain. And left brain core drives dealing with extrinsic motivation and things you do for reward or purpose or goal. So the idea of grinding is that you don't like the activity. It's monotonous and boring and laborious, but you want the reward. You want the status. You want the money. So you do it. Whereas the right brain core drives are intrinsic motivation. Like you do it just because you enjoy doing it. And you would even pay money just to experience it. And if you lost all your progress the next day, 
you would still want to do the activity because that's how we measure quality of lives. How much time we spend on things we just enjoy doing. Like what you just told me, a lot of people, a lot of entrepreneurs who have big exit, they don't need to work for this extrinsic motivation. They don't need to work for money and they're proven they don't have to work for respect or status and they try to retire, but then they can't stay to retire because it's like, why would you stop playing your favorite game? Right. And so you intrinsically want to go back into this game of yours and continue to create value and do what you love. So that's when people are truly successful, right? Doing what you love on a regular basis. Well said. Gosh, that's exactly right. And yeah, just kind of circling back and tying into what I was saying. I took this course. It's called the Yale Happiness Course. Have you heard of this? That's I have. the nickname. Mm -hmm. Great course. And a big focus of it is they use this term called miswantings and how society is sort of more and more evolving into this miswanting of wanting things that we think are going to make us happy, but actually don't make us happy. And as society has evolved with technology, and as we were talking about our, our knowledge of behavioral science and what motivates people, a lot of these big companies that have all the money are using that to monetize our attention, right? And I, I, I want to preface, I don't think these people are evil by any means. They, just like you, just like me, they went out to start a business. And, but things take on a life of their own. And when all of a sudden you're a public company and your main priority is pleasing your shareholders, like your hands are tied and you have to do certain things to make money. To, and that's leading to a lot of negative things, I think, in the world. The World Happiness Report is consistently going down every year when they do a survey. Teen suicide has been an all-time high and just keeps going up every single year. I think for the first time in the last couple of years, our lifespan is going down, right? It's been going up for the last like hundred or hundreds of years. So these things are happening. And I guess in short, technology and science are not always being used for good versus evil, to put it simply. and you're now kind of, you recognize that and you said, wow, like this is something that we can use for good versus evil. Is that kind of the gist of it? Yeah. And of course, as you alluded to any useful tool, like the internet or email can be used for good or evil, right? So many scammers use the internet and email to scam people. I'm sure with AI chat GPT, that scales even like uh, intimidatingly fast now Yeah. for the Octalis Rimmer game cage design. Yeah, the goal is to motivate people to do certain activities. And when it comes to ethics on that, there's two aspects. One is the, the purpose of the motivation, and one is the nature of the motivation. So the purpose is what are you trying to get people to do? And that could be good or evil. You could try to motivate people to improve their health, to access more, to care about the relationship, right? And use the same eight core drives, social influence, use development and accomplishment, use epic meaning and calling. But you can also use the same core drives to motivate people to commit genocide, which is some of the worst things in history. So there's the purpose of it. And it's a lot of times corporations, like you said, a lot of time when they, the founders start the company, they had aspirations of making the world better. And the problem with a corporation is that if you make $10 billion and five years later, you still make $10 billion, you're a failure, right? Because the stock price needs to keep going up. So now you have to find yeah. very, very creative ways to create ways that your competitors can't make crops anymore. Like everyone has to buy from you. Or, oh, everyone has to be stuck on your side. That's how you grow or spend more money than they want. And then there's the, what we call the nature of the design, which is what we call the white hat versus black hat, etc. So again, white hat makes people feel in control. They feel good. If you're in white environments a lot, you are happy. So for instance, epic media and calling. So you're doing things that are changing the world, getting close to your faith, meditation, development, accomplishment, you're improving yourself, reaching mastery. Core drive three is empowerment of creative feedback. So that's using your creativity, autonomy, meaningful choices. So if we're into these environments a lot, we actually feel happy. If we do activities that fulfill these, we feel happy. But there's no urgency. What we end up doing are the blackhead activities, like loss and avoidance. Oh, this deadline's coming up. Scarcity. Oh, there's this exclusive offer I have to take advantage of, or I have to get into this high status or else oh, I'm a loser. And then unpredictable curiosity. What's on Instagram? What's on HBO, whatnot. So we spend a lot of time doing those activities, but we don't necessarily feel happy because we feel out of control. And so oftentimes when people are in black hat environments, but it's motivating them to, let's say, work out more, right? Your gym trainer is yelling at you, calling you a loser when trying to do push-ups. Even though it feels terrible, 
after you thank you, Jim Trainer, thanks for pushing me harder than I could ever push myself. But if it's black hat to get you to just working overtime without proper compensation, then that's when people get really upset and they burn out and they consider this whole thing unethical. So yeah, I love the black hat and white hat stuff. Really, I thought that was genius when I when I first was looking at your eight core drives and I was like, yep, yep, yep. Because I, I wouldn't consider myself a, a behavioral scientist, but I've definitely read a lot of books on behavioral science. And it's a huge passion of mine to understand. I was a psychology major in college. Like, how does the brain work? Why do we do certain things? Why don't we do other things? And this black hat versus white hat stuff, I think is, is neat. And ever since I read that from your book, I can't unsee it. And when I'm on an app or looking at a new site or somebody's trying to get my attention to buy their product, I, I always immediately, I'm like, white hat, black hat, right? And the white hat is the good stuff. The black hat is the bad stuff to put it. Yeah. And I, I, simple term. I tend to clarify more. It's not good versus bad. It's white hat. You feel in control. It's part of our neocortex. Black hat. We feel out of control. It's our crocodile brain. And we feel we're out of control. It's because it's for our survival. We feel like we're hardwired to respond to our environments to, quickly to that. Uh, if this is not clear, it's called the octalysis because it's the combination between the word octagon analysis and all these eight core drives are graphed on the octagon. And what I'm just really lucky to have is when it came together, it really came together very elegantly in the sense that if you're on the corner, the right bottom corner is core drive seven, unpredictability and curiosity. So it's on the right bottom. So it's right brain. So it's intrinsic. Our brains enjoy it. And it's black hat where we feel out of control. So what does that mean? That means you wanted to go to bed at 10 p.m., but then you end up binge watching Netflix till three in the morning. Again, your brain enjoyed it, right? It's right brain, intrinsic, but you felt out of control. Now, if you look at the other opposite corner, the left top, that's core drive two, development accomplishment. So this is about getting a certificate or feeling advancement and whatnot. So it's white hat. We feel good and empowered as long as we feel progress and accomplishment, but it's left brain extrinsic. It's goal oriented. We're not doing this activity because it became more enjoyable. It's because we care about the goal. And this is what the problem is with most exercise apps out there. Those trackers, it's Playing on core drive to development accomplishment is showing your results. Hey, look, you ran a little bit further than last time. You're improving your score. So again, as long as you're feeling you're progressing, you're improving, you feel very motivated. But at one point when you plateau, you feel like I'm no longer improving. That's when you think, well, I don't want to do this anymore because running isn't more enjoyable right now for me. It's still the same thing. And now I don't feel the sense of progression. And that's why a lot of exercise apps, people use it for the same thing, like three to six months, and then they stop using it. So then... The solution is to add some of those right brain intrinsic motivated core drives to make the process of running more enjoyable. Interesting. Yeah, I want to get a little more into that. First, you've been kind of dropping some of these octolysis methods, the, the eight of them in here and there. Well, why don't we just go through them real quick, if you don't mind? That way, everybody can fully understand. So one through five, if I remember correctly, right, that's the white hat. And then six through eight is the black hat, correct? One through three is white hat. Four and five could be white or black, depending on how you design it. And then six, seven, eight are black hat. Yeah. Got it. So Got core it. drive one is epic meaning and calling. So this is, you're doing something bigger than yourself. You are saving the world. You're helping the environment. You care about justice or patriotism or love. Core drive two is development accomplishment that I just mentioned. Right. All right. Sorry to interrupt you. Can we give an example maybe for each so people can really oh, sure. understand? Sure, of course. Thank you. So this, for instance, would be why people contribute to Wikipedia. We know people don't contribute to Wikipedia because they can make money. They can't even advance their careers, update their resumes. A lot of people spent one to three hours every day after work updating contribute to Wikipedia because they believe they're protecting humanity's knowledge, something bigger than themselves. So then we have Core Drive 2 Development Accomplishment, and that's basically the feeling of improving yourself, leveling up, achieving mastery. So most of the points and badges you see in the gamification world fall into this core drive. And an example would be like Duolingo, right? You're, you're learning language and you see this progress bar, you see this tree that you're climbing up and you feel progression. Core drive three is empowerment of creativity and feedback. So that's again, giving you meaningful choices, autonomy, giving you self-expression. So anything that allows you to customize things and your avatar, your clothing, that motivates people a lot. And it's fun. It involves strategy. It's evergreen. Like that's why chess, again, doesn't have to keep adding more content to be engaging. Our brains are kind of entertaining itself because there's constantly new strategies to use to beat your opponent. Whereas 
other games that rely on other core drives, the moment they stop doing their weekly quests, monthly new heroes or new maps, people drop out. Core drive four is ownership and possession. So this is basically because you feel like you own something, you want to improve it, you want to protect it, you want to get more of it. So this is like basically collectibles, why we like to collect stamps, virtual goods, virtual currency, why Farmville was kind of fun. So if you, if you ever encounter any app that has a collection set and it's like, oh, go do this. And now you have the four seasons or 12 Zodiacs. That's, that's basically this core drive. Core, core drive five is social influence and relatedness. So this is everything you do based on what other people do think or say. So it deals with things like group quests, competition, collaboration, gifting, social appreciation. And so pretty straightforward. Kickstarter, right? It's like group quest concept where if you want to reach the win state and get a interesting reward, you can't do it by yourself. You have to invite your friends to do it with you and everyone comes in and either it's Groupon or Kickstarter or Indiegogo, right? You have to group buy into it together. And then once it reached the threshold, then everyone basically quote unquote beats the boss and reaches the win state, gets the reward. So that's an example there. Core drive six is scarcity and impatience. So this is basically saying we want something simply because we can't have it or it's very exclusive. And so the example I give is that back in the day when Facebook first launched, it says you're, you're only allowed to use Facebook if you go to Harvard. If you don't go to Harvard, you can't use Facebook. And then it opened to more schools and more people want to join more from more schools. So when it opened up to UCLA in 2004, when I was attending it, everyone rushed in, not because they already knew how great Facebook was, but it was that exclusively you're not allowed to do it. Okay, fine. You're allowed to do it. Another really interesting example about this core drive is if you want people to do something, set a limit to how many times they can do it, and then they'll actually have desire. So if you say, hey, go out and refer all your friends to my app, they're like, okay, sh sure, but I know it's good for you. How's it good for me? Are, are you going to pay me to do it? But if you add scarcity, you say, hey, you have three exclusive invites. That's all. Then people go around social media and they say, hey, who's one of my buddies? Who wants to get one of my three super exclusive invites to Clubhouse or Gmail or whatever, right? So if you, if you give them a thousand opportunities, they don't care. They do zero. You give them three only, then they start caring. Call that a magnetic cap. Core drive seven is unpredictability and curiosity. So this is a drive that says, because we don't know what's going to happen next, we're always thinking about it. So this is heavily utilized in the gambling industry. But whenever you have a sweepstake program, a lottery system, a raffle ticket system, or even like a mystery box, this core drive comes in play. And then core drive eight is the most simple one, it's kind of boring core drive eight, loss and avoidance. So it's basically, if you don't do something, you'll have a punishment. So you're doing it based on fear, avoiding negative outcomes. Sometimes it's uh, just avoiding uh, changing your behavior. I call that status quo sloth. It's like, you should go out and start your business, but then you're like, ah, Maybe I'll just sit here and do nothing. So, so that's also a loss and avoidance. So those together become the eight core drives of the Octalysis framework. And through my research, everything we do in the real world too is based on these eight core drives. So if there's none of these eight core drives there, there's zero motivation, no behavior happens. And that's why, like you said, when you walk around, you see people doing things that are motivating you. You'll see these eight core drives everywhere. Some people say it's like getting unplugged from the matrix. They see green code everywhere. I've heard once that someone said, like jokingly said, it's like a curse. It's like now the world is different. They can't reverse it. So uh, can't unsee it, right? Like yeah, said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so. totally. That's interesting. But I, I mean, I look at it as a blessing, not a curse, because to me, knowledge is power and awareness. And the more you're aware of yourself and the world around you and how it works, and then it goes into your mindset, which is one of my cores, which is the most important of these these five core elements that we all possess mindset relationships career finance physical health emotional health and if you have a mindset that's the glass is half empty and it's growth versus fixed you're looking at that as okay well maybe it's a little depressing in some ways that this is how our brains work or that we're basically hamsters on a wheel some people might look at it that and we're just victims to these things that motivate us or okay now i understand what it is that truly motivates human beings and myself, how can I use that and my business, my product, whatever I'm doing to move things along and hopefully for good versus evil, right? Like we talked about earlier. So speaking of that, I have a question. You mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, some of these games we get tired of, right? After a certain period, some we want to keep doing like chess, you've heard use an example. 
well, let's get into the key elements of that. Like, what are those types of games and products that we want to keep using? And what do you think are maybe the main Octolysis components that they're using? And is there a crossover between them? Is it just kind of sporadic? Like one might have these three Octolysis components, one might have these and there's no connection. Well, you can do it by chance and luck, sometimes intuition, or you can do it by design, which obviously helps reproduce results. And so generally speaking, if it's left brain core drive, extrinsic motivation, you do it again, because of the goal, the reward or a milestone, but you don't necessarily enjoy the result itself. So once you obtain the reward, you hit your milestones or the reward becomes stale, you stop caring about it, you stop doing the activity. Whereas the right brain core drives are about intrinsic motivation. You just want to spend as much time doing it as possible. And again, those are core drive three, five, seven, empowerment of creative feedback. So we enjoy using our creativity, coming with strategies. So that never gets old. Core drive five, social influence and relatedness. So for instance, a lot of people since let's say middle school, they might hang out with the same two or three friends for three or four hours every single day. And there's no reward, right? There's no badges, no progress bar, no, no like cryptocurrency NFT, but it's just evergreen. People just sit there and they just hang out and they enjoy it. And in fact, a lot of people who are grownups think back to those times very fondly and think, oh, I wish I could just go back to the good old days where we just hang out and do nothing for hours, right? So that's intrinsic. And then core drive seven is unpredictability and curiosity. And we actually don't necessarily need a reward to enjoy that suspense of mystery and unpredictability. So an example I give very often is, let's say you sit there and you press a button for four hours straight and you're guaranteed a paycheck. That's kind of boring, right? That's like a job at a factory. Most people don't like that. But let's say you sit there and you press a button for four hours straight and maybe you'll get a paycheck. Maybe you won't. Maybe you'll even lose money. Suddenly that's casino you know, gambling. And a lot of people like that, right? And it makes no sense. Same behavior. One, you're guaranteed a payout. And the other, you're actually most likely going to lose money because that's why the casinos make so much money. But our brains choose the latter because we're literally paying for that entertainment of maybe I'll win, maybe I'll win. That experience intrinsically is what you're paying for. And that's why I have friends who start telling me, oh, we just came out of casino. We lost 200 bucks, but that was so much fun. Let's come back a week later. In fact, I was doing some advisory for the Singaporean government. And in Singapore, there's one big casino and it's meant for foreigners. So foreigners can all go in for free, but Singaporeans actually have to pay 100 Singaporean dollars, which was at, at the time about 70 US dollars, just to get in. So I asked their lottery boards. So are people actually paying this 100 bucks? And like, oh yeah, we make hundreds of millions of dollars every single year just from the $100 deposit alone. And so these people are paying, again, 70 US dollars just for the right to lease even more money to the casino. Clearly, they're not seeing this as a reliable way to build their wealth, but they're paying for the thrill and entertainment. And in fact, when they saw the Octals, they looked at Core Drive 6, like, oh yeah, we noticed something about scarcity too. When foreigners come in, they gamble for three to five hours and they feel happy they leave. But when a Singaporean pays the 100 bucks, they'll get a 24 hour window to gamble. And because it's so scarce, it's so limited, they gamble oh, for 24 man. hours straight and they lose all their money. That now, is wicked. Yeah, yeah. That and, is wicked. and so this is the unintended design consequence, right? They were trying to reduce that gambling for Singaporeans. But in fact, because they didn't consider all the core drives, they actually created unintended effects and it like wrecked more families. So that's why you want that's to understand these things. Yeah, no, that's, that's really interesting. So as you're talking more, I guess I thought I knew that it was pretty kind of black and white. I knew there was some great crossover between the first five and then the last three, or excuse me, I should say the first four, and as far as black and white hat and then like, I use the word good versus bad, but no, it's more like you were saying how our brain and how this is applied it, and it's how the company's using it. And, right? and let me explain to you why the ones in the middle. So one, two, three is white hat, six, seven, eight are black hat, four and five are in the middle. So let me explain. Core drive five is in the middle. It's social influence and relatedness. So if you design to be white hat, then it's about social appreciation, collaboration, right? Gifting feels good, but there's no urgency. If you design to be black hat, it's about peer pressure, about competition, give people a leaderboard. And so everyone works like crazy for the short being because they don't want to be the biggest loser, but they burn out because it becomes a cutthroat environment. So that's what I mean when the ones in the middle, you can choose to design it to be a white hat or a black hat. Got it. And can you give us an example of a company that's using black hat for good versus evil? Yeah. So obviously you want to utilize a combination. It's about using the right quarter at the right time because we also have the 
player's experience journey, discovery phase, onboarding, scalp, and endgame. It, it gets, again, a lot more random words I'm dumping on everyone. But just to give a, a, an example, probably everyone has faced before, which is, uh, let's say there's the char charitable organization and you like them, you kind of think about donating to them, but you have to call them or do something and it's just like you're procrastinating. So your white hat motivation, let's say Epic Media and Calling, feels like, hey, I want to help them. And if you do, you feel good, you feel happy, but you just don't get to it. So then a lot of times you might see them do this thing, the scarcity tactic, which is, hey, we just have a generous donor that says for the next two hours, whoever donates, he'll match their donation, right? But only the next two hours. And suddenly there's a scarcity period. You feel like I have to prioritize this or else this opportunity will be gone after a while. So because of that, you create urgency, you prioritize, you donate the money. But you don't feel terrible about it because you wanted to donate it to them like at the beginning, you just never got to it. So even though they use black hat, you feel good because it took you back to that white hat environment. Just like, again, another example I gave was the gym trainer who calls you a loser while you're doing push-ups. It's something that you feel bad because it's black hat. You feel out of control, right, and urgent, but it actually leads you to something you actually want to do and you feel good about it. I love that. Yeah, that's a good example. And we mentioned briefly, I'm working on this app. It's been a labor of love for the last couple of years, actually. And an example of exactly what you're talking about, but we'll use the example of loss and avoidance. So I play this game called Words with Friends. Are you familiar? Yep. Are you as addicted as I am or you just know it? I, I played it a little bit before a few years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So there's like, there's two games that I've just had in my phone for years and it's, and as you were saying, there's some that just keep you going and then some you're kind of like, oh, that was fun. And then you ditch them, uh, words with friends and clash of clans for different reasons, but for words with friends in particular, it's evolved over. And I noticed they keep tweaking, right? So somebody in there is as smart as you, and they keep tweaking these little, and like I said, now that I've seen it, I can't unsee it. These, these autolysis methods and they're using scarcity and epic calling and empowerment and creativity and all these things. But one of the ones that they use that I think is the most effective is called streaks. And so what happens is, and so this ties to number eight, loss and avoidance. Each day, you need to play a game against somebody. And you get a basically a, a check mark saying, okay, streak completed. And if you get seven in a row, you get a mystery box, right? And so that's definitely one that works for me because I'm like, I want that mystery box because I want coins because coins allow me to upgrade and, and buy things and do these things. But that's being used, obviously, to get us addicted to their product. And there's always like a, hey, buy this six pack for only, two, they use the scarcity, only twenty nine ninety nine, which I've never in my life bought anything in a game, I'm proud to say, but I know that that's a huge, huge industry. So similar concept in my app, part of it is you're checking in each day. It's essentially a habit tracker, but you're a rocket ship and you start on the ground. And in order to break the Earth's gravitational pull, you have to slowly but surely start building up your success habits in each of your core areas, and you've got to check in each day. And so I'm using the same thing, which is a streak feature in order to, you got to get seven in a row. You got to check in each day. It's not about how well you do that day. It's about the fact that you've got these habits that you're working on and you're looking at them each morning and you're saying, okay, this is what's top of mind. These are the main ones that I want to focus on that are going to level up my life in each of these cores. And then at the end of the day, you're actually giving yourself a score. And it's not about the score you give yourself. It's just about the actual process of training your brain to be looking at these things every day. And so I do the same thing with streaks where you get a, a reward and you can upgrade your ship, you can get battle armor, better thrusters, these types of things, and so on and so on. But if you don't check in, you go down to the previous level. So you're not like going all the way back to the start, but there is an element of, okay. And so that hopefully, I haven't, we haven't A-B tested it yet, but that's using that same concept. So what you said actually displays a strong insight because most people, when they see a street design, and especially when they design it, they'll say, oh, this is Core Drive 2, development accomplishment. People feel accomplished when it says you're 20 days in a row, 50 days in a row, 90 days in a row. And that might be true at the beginning, but as you noted, as time goes on, it always shifts back to loss and avoidance, Core Drive 8, because at that point, you're just like, oh, I'm afraid to lose my streak. I'm afraid to lose. And you're afraid to go on an airplane, right? Because you might miss the time zone to, to complete your streak. And so while it's happening, it has the, all the black hat effects, which means you're obsessed. Every day you want to make sure you get it. Before you go to bed, you're like, oh, I haven't done this yet. I got to do it. But the moment you lose that streak, the same black hat effects happen. You burn out. You're like, okay, I guess that was a good run, but I'm never going to do 120 days in a row anymore. So then you just check out completely. 
And so because of that, companies have designs to mitigate some of that. Sometimes they say, oh, every seven days you get like a vacation day. So it mitigates you actually burning out. What you experience is actually one of those. You don't lose your whole streak. You drop down by a level. So there's still some penalty to make sure you don't lose your streak. You come back every day. But when you do get punished, it's not so demoralizing. You just quit. So that's actually pretty strong insight. Another example of loss and avoidance in a more positive way is this app called Forest. I don't know if you heard about it before. What is it uh, called? It's called Forest, like, a, forest. like the, the woods and the forest. So it's basically, it's a productivity app that's a countdown timer. So he's like, okay, I'm going to focus doing my task for whatever, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. You set the timer counts down. Okay. When you finish, when it finishes count, counting down, it does plant a tree in your virtual forest and you can type what I accomplished. However, the trick of it is that if you get distracted and you start playing with your phone, your tree will die. Okay. And it will just say, hey, you failed your quest too bad. It'll plant your dead tree into the forest. So for a whole year, you'll have to stare at your failure that I wasn't focusing on my task. I was playing around with my phone. And, and so this app, I think, has more than 40 million downloads now. And more than, wow. if I remember correctly, more than 8 million of them are paying users. And it's a pretty strong monetization. I have heard of that. Yeah, now that you're talking about it. Yes, that, that's a good one. That's another example of using these things for good versus evil. So speaking of that, why don't we get into, you've got a new book coming out. So your first book, if you were to summarize what the target market and who it's for, what would you say? And then we'll go into your, your second book and yeah. discuss that. So my first book is for anyone who wants to design a gamified experience, mostly for other people. So you're a entrepreneur designing a product, you're a marketer, you're an educator, you're a minister of labor or whatever. You can do it for yourself too, but it's a bit harder for some reasons. And or you're designing for children, right? So it talks about these eight core drives, the mechanics of how to do design and how to make it happen. But generally speaking, on a higher level, it's a bit more B2B. It's people want to design a program. And so when I was thinking about my second book, because I have about five, six books of content in my head, I was thinking, okay, I can make a more advanced version of my first book because there's definitely way more advanced stuff for people to learn about. But then I thought, well, you have to read the first book to have the second book be relevant. So that means if I write a second book, that my target addressable market, are, it's, it's only as big as the people who re already read the first book. And I don't like that number, okay? I'd rather host workshops and whatnot to focus on that group. So I actually went more upstream, which is what really changed my life, which is turning my own life into a game since 2003 and I saw all the things I do as a game and that's how I got myself from being a pretty mediocre student at the time to excelling at pretty much everything I was doing and so the second book is titled 10,000 hours of play short for 10k HP and so it builds on the idea if you read uh, Malcolm Gladwell's book outliers it talks about this 10,000 hours of training and learning experience makes you an expert on something, makes you successful in life. Now, there's a lot of debate about whether it's actually 10,000, but that's beyond the point. It's just a lot of time. So the premise of the book is that, okay, even though that might be true, if you gamify your life correctly, it doesn't have to be 10,000 hours of blood, sweat, and tears. It could be 10,000 hours of enjoying everything you do, playing, having fun. And at the end of this 10,000 hours of play and enjoyment, you automatically become successful in life and you loved every step in it. And so it breaks down our life journey into six steps. Step one is finding your game, like understanding which game you're going to play for your life. Number two is understanding your attributes. What are your innate talents? And uh, step three would be uh, choosing your role in the game that you're playing based on the talents you identified, attributes. And then step four is identifying skills you need to learn to become the highest level player of that role you just cho chose. And what are the skills you lack and how to obtain them? Step five is finding allies. These are people playing the same game as you, but they have complementary skills. And so you can help each other and grow and mentors, mentees, get joined in guild. And then finally, step six is taking on quests, which are things that allow you to learn the skills, move forward towards your, your goal in your game, and then build chemistry with your allies. So it's that six step process that, that I'm teaching and documenting and also connecting some of the historical figures, I call the OP heroes, like Disney, like Elon Musk, Oprah, Gandhi. We just talked about how they played their game 
with their attributes and their role and their allies and all that stuff. So that's, that's what my second book will be about. That's very cool. Yeah. Right in my wheelhouse. It's funny. I always talk about these universal principles of life. And before we got on this, I briefly mentioned when you were asking me, who's exactly your target audience? And I said, well, you, <laughs> James Clear and, and Ray Dalio wrote this book called Principles. And you, there's these principles that have been around since the beginning. They're going to be around until we destroy ourselves. Hopefully not. You, you can hang your hat on them, black hat or white hat, pun intended that you can rely on these types of things. And so you want to build your life around them. You want to build your business around them, right? And so the way I, I look at it, similar to, it's interesting, you're talking about your six steps, finding your game, understanding attributes, what's your role, identifying skills to learn, finding allies, taking on quests. Uh, I put it in terms of, it's the same principle of the importance of figuring out who you are, what you want, and how to get it. And it's kind of a similar universal principle to me where your brain works a certain way and you're showing it in the way that you see it, which is obviously extremely helpful. And people have already bought into this concept and they can take the concept of the octalysis and, and continue it on into this. And whereas mine's more revolved around these five core areas of your life that we all share, right, that we mentioned, and we all need to continue to keep growing and building momentum and happiness is growth. But it's also balance, in my opinion. And that's one of the ones that people forget about. And the Yale happiness course we talked about earlier got into how these miswantings, like it's all about the money and the career, where it's like, no, there's the physical health, there's your mindset, there's your emotional health, there's relationships, you got to pay attention to all of these things. And you got to continue to grow, but you got to understand who you are, like, what is it that makes you tick? What are the current habits that you have in each of these cores? And then how can you replace them like what's going to be the best and that's where the gamification stuff comes in that i'm just so fascinated about and i love using is like rather than try to use willpower and i don't think i have to tell you but it drives me nuts you go on like tiktok and instagram and talking about using things for good versus evil i don't think these people are ill-intended but now there's a zillion experts they're just coming on they're regurgitating information they're giving a little tip that's not going to move the needle in anybody's life because what's going to happen is the person's going to see that they're going to get inspired for like a quarter of a second. And they're gonna be like, yeah, I should totally do that until they scroll to the next thing. And then they're right, like, oh, there's a dancing monkey on a chair. So it, it's about using these things to trick our brains and to actually combine stuff like James Clear's making it obvious, making it rewarding and attractive, making it satisfying making it easy, these types of things with your core drives and, and sort of saying, these are all these things that motivate us. These are the things that make us take action. So be aware of them, be aware of the habits that you currently have. And how can we plug these things in until those habits that we want to replace them with become inevitable. And to me, that's it. That's life right there. If you can figure out like, what are these habits that are hurting me and making me less happy, less healthy, less successful? and identify those and then replace them. You're sweeter than you who, right? And it sounds like you have also realized this and that your system kind of ties into that. Yeah, and, yeah. and I think unsurprisingly, there is actually a somewhat of a formula of truth to gaining success and happiness in your life, right? It's not a thousand unique ways. There's actually a few main ways, but they are seen through different lenses and they're understand differently. And sometimes the analogy pops for one, but not the other. And I know there's a lot of concepts out there that's potentially, I would say, more concise and efficient. So it's like, hey, these are the things laid out, do it. And I like to go with the gaming angle because I think a gameful attitude makes a huge difference because there's tons of people I talk to, even young and old. It's very, okay, let's just talk about college students. They'll tell me that, oh, when I build my game character at level two, he needs to learn the skill, level five, level 10, the skill, level 20. And so at level 80, this is like the strongest character with all these skills synergizing and all that stuff, right? And I said, so what do you want to do two years from now, four years from now, what college class are you going to take? Like, oh, I don't know. It's too big. I don't have the capability to process it. Then they actually do literally more and beyond, but they feel scared about it and they're intimidating. So they don't want to touch it. And so we talk about when you have a gamer mentality, right? If you play a game where it's just everything smooth, just keep going forward and forward and forward and forward, and then you beat the game, that's a pretty boring game. No one wants to play that game, right? A game purposely right. adds obstacles to the game. They add bad guys who want to attack you, 
pitfalls to fall into and obviously even even golf it's not just putting the ball into the hole it's about hitting it with a weird stick in a long distance there's sand puddles and all that stuff to add frustration because every bad guy is an opportunity to score higher more points improve yourself kick ass be awesome right and so when you play games you expect these things to be there or else it's not fun but when you face life, a lot of people are like, oh, why is my life so terrible? Why are there people trying to attack me? Or why do I face all this friction? But if you take a gamer mentality, it's like, oh, wow, cool. I get to tackle these things now. I get to grow. I get to figure it out. So that is my unique angle. If you see your life as a game, then everything feels different, looks different, and you have a lot of fun while doing the most. People who see their work as a game, they become rockaholics. Like, why would you want to go to the beach when you can be playing your favorite game, right? And, and so that's the angle I, I took. And I feel like for a lot of people, it probably is something that could get them out of the frustration they're currently in. Man, I love it. And just going back to how we started this conversation, making things fun. Like this taps into this part of our brain. At the end of the day, we were all kids once. We were all born into the world full of wonder, joy, enthusiasm. Not even the sky was the limit, right? And our number one priority in life was what? to play and squeeze every drop of awesomeness out of every day. And then life starts to get in the way and we start picking up these habits. I call them our major influencers, our parents, and it's our peers, and it's school, then it's media. And then we have certain experiences. And before we know it, we've developed habits. And in my opinion, we are, we are our habits, our habits are us. And when you have these habits, your brain, your actions, everything starts revolving around these things. And it's like, okay, it's really, really hard to change your habits. Like they dig in deep with their claws. And that's why, like I was saying, you go on social media and stuff and you think you're gonna like change your life. You're not. You have to have a system in place. And why not have one that is fun? Tapping back into that emotion that we all, and that's that, to me, I just think that's so neat and exciting. And I love that you're using it as the center of what you're doing. And I think it's the future. Personally, and you are seeing gamification being used in a lot of products. It's a big buzzword these days, but I still don't see enough of them doing what you're talking about and what I'm talking about doing with them. I still think a lot of it is to sell their product. And so it's neat when you start to see it being used the other way. Duolingo, you mentioned earlier, that's a good example of one. I've checked that one out. If you want to learn a new language, they really nailed the gamification piece. Yeah. They're using a lot of those octalysis. And there is an interesting relationship between discipline and motivation and habit, like you talked about, because discipline is something that you just don't like, you hate, but you, the goal is important. So you just push through it, right? But if you're motivated, if there's motivation, you don't need discipline, right? You don't need discipline to play your favorite game. You actually need discipline to stop playing your favorite game. And similarly, if something becomes a habit, you also don't need motivation to do it anymore. You actually need motivation to stop doing a habit. So a lot of times the design process is, okay, it requires too much discipline. People can't do it from sheer willpower. So we make it fun and exciting. And when we make it fun, people start doing it. Eventually it becomes a habit and they don't even have to think about it anymore. They just do it. So a lot of times that is that life transforming behavioral change where you're starting to do all the effective things without even thinking about it. I like how you just put that. I mean, I talk about this stuff all the time about how discipline is eroding, kind of going back to what we were talking about earlier, like we're living in a society where we're just leaps and quantum leaping with technology and science and you know, a lot of times I think we get to the point where, well, I should say the younger generation, it's like, okay, I can literally click a button and get anything I want on the planet delivered to me in less than an hour, including my body into a vehicle across town. Why do I need to work? Right. And it's a little bit of an exaggeration, but the point is the more low hanging fruit is put in front of us and the easier it is to grab. I think that discipline that you're just talking about is really, really hard is becoming harder and harder to have. Whereas our parents' generation and their parents' generation, right? You go back 150 years and you wanted milk. Okay, you're going out to the cow and you are milking that cow, right? You're not hitting a button and having it delivered. So there's a lot to be said for that. And the fact that what you said nails it, it's tricking that your brain into basically replacing discipline with fun. So you're still going to be developing discipline, but you're kind of having fun doing it. 
Do yeah, you it's that? like that discipline of kids waking up 3 a.m. in the morning to secretly log onto their computer's iPads to level up their characters. It's like they don't have discipline anything else. They have no work ethics. They're the spoiled next generation. But they still wake up early or late in the morning and they could get grounded. They could be punished, but they still do it every day just because they want to get to the next level and maybe get that powerful sword, right? That's the gameful discipline that we're talking about. And it's not even hard work for them. They just really want to do it. Yep. And one of my taglines for what I'm doing is when you level up on screen, you also level up in real life. And I think that kind of sums it all up. So this has been amazing. I want to really thank you for being on the show. I mean, I could probably have you on all day, every day, but I know you're a busy man and I appreciate you giving me the time. I always like to ask my guests, if you don't mind, just one more question, which relates to habits. And you would be a really interesting one to ask this. And then we'll, we'll close out. What do you think the top habit that you have developed in your life that has really helped you as a human being to grow, whether it's health, happiness, success, all of them. And what gamification elements do you think that you're using to either trick your brain to get there or you're still using today to make sure that you can. All right, I'd say this question is hard because like we said, when it becomes a habit, it's just seamless. You don't even remember you're doing it. But I have a, a quick answer, which is I remember that at one point, I, I understood the psychology that how you express it for your body, which is more core drive three empowerment of creative and feedback actually affects how our brain thinks. So when we smile, it actually tells our brain that we should be happy. So whenever I go into a situation that's distressful, that's nervous, whenever my wife and I seem to be starting to get into an argument, I start smiling. I just force myself to smile. And then it calms me down and I can deal with the situation much better. And they made some crazy experience. Like if you just bite a pencil this way, or let's just bite a pencil this way, when you bite a pencil this way, you're in a much happier mood because your spouse is smiling. And if you bite the other way, you're more frowning in a way. So you actually are in a worse mood. So that's a habit. I haven't thought about it much, but yes, I do do that. So my wife knows this is my- so now it's become automatic, but maybe yeah. you're saying at one point you used the gamification method. You thought about the pencil trick yeah. and that helped you. To yeah, so it. when my wife sees me with this smiley face, she knows I'm actually really, really angry right now. <laughs> well, okay, so does that now do you need to change that? Is that no, a I mean, trigger for her? It's okay that she knows I'm angry. I mean, okay. that's the thing about emotions, expression. People know you're sad, happy, angry, and they can decide how they want to engage with it, right? But at least this face is way better than an actual angry face and it helps me moderate my emotions and deal with it healthily. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. This has, again, been amazing. What would you like to, where can people find you? I know you got a new book coming out. Yeah, so uh, yukaichao.com, Y-U-K-A-I-C-H-O-U.com. If you Google gamification framework, gamification expert should be the top results. If you want to find my first book, you go to Amazon and you search gamification should be the first result. And that kind of leads to all the other places that I, that I do things. And yeah, it was a big joy being here. I'm happy to be a frequent comer whenever you feel like it's interesting again. So just let me know. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much. Thanks everybody for tuning in. That's it for the Gamify Your Habits podcast with Will Moore. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and be sure to visit moremomentum.com to learn how you can gamify your life.